Say what? You can call it whatever you want. All right. How'd you make out with yesterday's ODP? I didn't intend it to be extremely taxing, but it seemed to confuse a number of people. Um, it was supposed to be a fairly small embellishment on the previous ODP. that holds 10 things, right? And then your put routine, so is the first argument the location, second argument is the value? Is that how it was set up? Yeah. Okay. So you want to save this integer at some location associated with this integer, and this integer is going to go from 0 to 9. So you can just pop it into that element in the array, right? Return your zero because for some reason I said you should return a zero, right? And there's there's a fine put routine. And so if you put four comma twenty three, right? It's going to save that number at index four. So it's a way to store 10 values and then later retrieve those. Get, and you just tell it, you know, the ID of the number that you want. Just return it from your save array. So that, that was what you wanted to do um, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. So when I I say the same thing, so when I enter eleven, it still it may still work, but it shouldn't. In fact, ten shouldn't work. I mean, you shouldn't you shouldn't try to put something into locations ten on up. But when you create memory for this, right? It allocates four bytes for each of these locations. But there's a good chance that these locations down here are also available, right? They won't give you a seg fault. It's possible you'll step on some other variable, but it's possible you won't. Um, but it doesn't usually pack everything in so that if you go one byte outside of your array, you get an error. Um, a lot of times you get away with it. The danger is that there may be other things, like this could be, um, you know, where some variable x is stored. And now if you try to store an element 10, you actually end up overwriting the value of x. So it doesn't always give you an error, but it may actually be doing something wrong. There's switches you can turn on when you compile to enforce bounds checking, and there's other ways that you can check for this kind of thing, and we'll talk about those later in the course. So 421 is, is more straightforward. You pass in two arguments. Um, second argument is an array of integers. First argument tells you how many integers are in that array. Add up those elements and just return the sum. That's all it's asking for. So the second argument is a bunch of integers. How many? That's what the first argument tells you. So you just loop from 0 up to that first argument, minus 1. Add the elements from the array to a running sum, return that sum. That should get you 10 out of 10. Does that make sense? Are these getting easier or harder, about the same? Easier, harder. Mm -hmm. Easier, harder, easier. Um, okay. 
So I would say if, if you're feeling like you're barely getting these done or you're trial and erroring and getting it to work but you're not sure why, or you're not getting 10 out of 10 on these, right? Shoot me a note or come by and talk to me and, and let's talk about other ways that you can work on some of these things to try to feel like you're being more successful with them because they should be sort of paralleling what we're doing in, in the course, um, what you're doing in your larger programming assignments and so on. And I, I intend them to be, you know, a tool that you can use to improve your skills, not just a, an assessment that says, you know, I understand everything or I don't understand anything. I want them to be kind of guided exercises that help you practice the things that you want to practice to be more successful with the material in this course. So if you feel like that's not happening, definitely come and talk to me, okay? All right, so we were going through this list yesterday, and I think we finished talking about if then, if then else, and stuff like that. Is that right? All right, so let's let's just keep going through here. So, um, you want to know how to do while loops, and here's the way I've been suggesting: while space bracket bracket space oh, condition. Bracket, bracket, do, and then done. So you definitely want to know how to do this, right? Um, and you can exercise this from the command line as well. X equals zero, wall bracket, X is less than 10, do echo x, x equals x plus 1, done, right, and it runs my while loop for me. And I can go back and edit this. And do my even numbers or whatever, right? And again, don't get tripped up by what it look, looks like when you do a command line recall with the semicolons. Right? This is the way that I'm trying to consistently describe while loops in bash. And what you do in this stuff can be anything. Right? It could be another while loop. It could be if statements. It could be just plain old echoes. It can be things with back quotes. It can be anything. Right? Um, so definitely know how to, to put together a while loop. Um, there are for loops in bash also. We have not talked about for loops. And there's a question on the exam that I'm asking you to use a while loop. And you can do it with a for loop, but I'm not going to let you use a for loop. I want to see you use a while loop. Okay, so make sure you know how to do whiles. Um, and play around with it on the command line if not. Um, variable assignment and interpretation, we've kind of already talked about that. Um, you can say variable equals blah, and it's equal to blah, and then if you say dollar sign variable, it gives you the value of it. Um, when you want to do arithmetic, do dollar sign parentheses, parentheses, and put your expression inside here. So. Right, and that'll actually do arithmetic operations. You can put dollar signs on your variables in here, but you don't need them. It'll go ahead and expand them, so I've generally not been putting them in there. But either way is fine. And you can assign that to something, or you can just put that in an echo statement, or whatever. Um, x equals 12, y equals 20.
So echo x plus y times 2, that's 40 plus 12, 52. You got the idea, right? But that's really useful inside while loops if you're trying to increment variables, right, like that. So the use of the dollar sign with double brackets, brackets is uh, arithmetic operations? You mean this? Yeah. And what? Well, it's a good question. It might understand precedence of operations. Yeah, it does. Again, I'm lazy. I don't like to think, so I just put them in there. All right, so it doesn't work like that. And without the dollar sign, it gets freaked out. And there are other ways to do this. And if you're Googling, you find things like eval and you find all kinds of, of other statements and left brackets will do evaluation and so on and so forth. But if you know this way, right, you probably won't go wrong. Um, doesn't mean it's the best way, but it's the way that we keep using in here. All right, um, read and echo, so, so input and output, right? And the most common form is just you know, read variable. And it stops and waits for you to type something in and hit an enter, and whatever you type in becomes the value of the variable. Straightforward. And then echo we've been using throughout. So echo blah just puts blah on your screen. And if there's dollar signs, they get expanded. If there's back quotes, they get expanded, and so on and so forth. So not a whole lot of, of mystery there. Um, and usually my emphasis for Bash is going to be on algorithms, right? So there's no point in my asking you questions about the syntax of a while statement because you've got eight pages of notes, right? And you've been writing while statements for several weeks. Um, that would be a really silly thing to base the exam on, right? So I want to know, can you write algorithms? So write a loop that adds up these numbers or write a loop that reads from standard in until something happens, right, or whatever. Um, so think algorithms, and that's ODPs and programming assignments, basically. Good sources of practice. Go back to 121, look at the stuff you did in there, think about those algorithms, could you put those in Bash? Right, can you make a compound interest program in Bash? Can you test prime numbers in Bash? Right, it's just another language. The algorithms don't change, though. Okay, so C programming, basic syntax. Everybody knows how to write an if statement, a for loop, how to do variable assignment, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, don't forget to initialize variables. If you want a variable to have a value of zero, make sure somewhere you set that variable equal to zero. There's always like a point or two that gets lost because of that. Remember to initialize variables. Don't assume something's equal to zero unless you've set it equal to zero. Um, Characters, right, single quote, x, single quote, that's the character x. It's a single byte, takes eight bits of storage, and it contains the ASCII code for this letter, if we're on our server, right? Well, um, a lot of times we toss these things around in integers. Integers hold 32 bits, four bytes. That's plenty of space for holding a character, okay? But this is just a number. If this is quote a, it's the same thing as an 8-bit integer equal to 65, because that's the ASCII code for A. OK, arrays are collections of things. So what do you want to know about arrays? Well, you can declare them as follows. Right, this declares an array called data, and it says it's going to hold 100 integers. The value of data 0 is unknown. Unless we initialize it, we don't know what's in that location. We don't know what's in any of the elements in the array. But we can you know, give it some value if we want. If your array holds 100 things, the largest element is index 99. 
right, because we start from zero. Um, and when you say DATA in a program, that's actually a memory location. Okay, so this thing means the memory address. of the first element of the array. So array of 100 integers, set the first element equal to zero, and then I'm going to print out the value of data as a percent D. It is definitely not going to print a zero. It will complain when I compile, but it prints out a weird number. If we print that out in hex, it's a little less weird. That's a memory location. Right, so data, four letter word, means the address of the first element in your data array. So if we print out address of data zero, right, it's exactly the same thing as when we just printed the word data. If we also print the address of data bracket one, Right, data zero was at um, three f five zero. Data one is at three f five four. It's four numbers higher. Right, these are memory locations. So three f five zero. That's where data bracket zero is stored. Four bytes later, that's where data bracket one is stored. Right, because an integer takes exactly four bytes on this machine. If I do this on my laptop, it would go up by eight because it's a sixty-four bit version. No, it would still go up by four. I lied. Integers are still four bytes. All right, so we can declare arrays like that. So if we call a function and we pass data to it, right, so we declare our function to be something that takes a pointer to an integer because arrays are pointers. Right, and if inside our function we print out the value of that argument that we were passed, right, it's exactly the same as the value of data or the address of data bracket zero. So when you pass an array to a function, you're not passing all those numbers to the function, you're passing the address of the first element. And that's exactly what arrays mean. So inside here, if I ask for the address of element one of our argument, right, it's exactly the same thing as what our main program said was the address of element one of our data array. Right, because you pass the same starting address, then when you try to get to the nth element, you're going to get to the same location as in the caller. So there's there's this this multiple world view of what an array is, right? It's it's just an array that we access by saying brackets, but it's also um, an address of something in memory, right? And it's also a pointer to the first element of of this array's contents, but they're all the same thing. Okay, so when you have a character array, that's 
slightly different. A character array is like car string bracket 30. Well, same thing. If I just say string, it refers to the address or the first element. And I can pass it to functions, and my functions can set up an argument that's a car star. And I can say string bracket 0 equals you know, single quote some character. But you can also say something like this. I can say string equals double quote and I can type something in. And this, the compiler sets up somewhere in memory. It finds some location, it stores an H-E-L-L-O and a null terminator. And this is setting string to be whatever location in memory this H is stored at. Right, so this is just kind of a way to initialize a string. but it's really still just an array. Right, if I do this, I can look at string bracket 2, and I'll see a lowercase l. But if I were to try to do this, right, that's going to do bad things. Because this is a character, this is an 8-bit number. This is supposed to be a memory address. So I'll get some compile warnings, but I think it'll still run. But if I do that and I try to do anything with string, I'm going to get weird results. Right, so, so string is a car pointer, and when I print out its value, it happens to be zero initially, which is why if I use string without initializing it, I'll get a seg fault. And then I set string equal to quote hello, and now when I look at string, it's this strange looking number, right? That's a location in memory. So that's what string looks like right now. That's what string looks like at this point. Its address is this. And if I examine that location, it's got H E. Oh, what does it have? It should have hello. confused myself. Oh, string's already a car pointer. Um.
Never mind. I ain't get down a rabbit hole here. All right. So, so the point here is when you say string equals code hello, right? The compiler's setting up some location in memory that has hello, and you're just setting string to point to that location. All right. And null terminators, you understand null terminators, right? It's just a convention. Um, earlier when you uh, printed the value of data one, the mm -hmm. element in the array, it, how could the number that was four be greater than data zero? The address of data one, yeah. Right. Can't you access data one by dereferencing data plus one? Yes. How does that work? It's something I really don't like about C, is when you do pointer arithmetic, it always scales what you add by the size of the thing it's pointing to. And that bothers me personally. But when you add one to a pointer that's a pointer to an integer, it'll actually add four to it. If it's a pointer to a character, it'll actually add one. If it's a pointer to a double, it would add eight. If it's a It would add whatever the size of a memory address is. So a 64-bit machine, it would add 8. 32-bit machine, it'll add 4. Same thing if you just plus plus a pointer. It doesn't always just add 1. It looks at what it's pointing to, and it compiles code that will add the appropriate amount. It's a feature, but to me, it's a feature that kind of goes against sort of the purity of C <laughs> as being kind of a, a high-level version of assembly language. Um, but yeah, that is what it does. All right, characters array, character arrays. Okay, uh, main programs. So um, try to understand argc argv. Okay. Um, argc is the number of arguments on the command line, including the program name itself. argv is an array of strings that contain each of the arguments, including the program name itself. So if argc equals 3, You have three command line arguments, and those are accessible as argv bracket 0, argv bracket 1, argv bracket 2. If argc is equal to 3, and you try to access argv bracket 3, you may say fault. OK, this tells you how many argvs you can access safely. So if you run a program with no command line arguments, argc should be equal to 1, and argv bracket 0 contains the name of the program. And that's the only argv that you're allowed to access. So if you're writing a piece of code on the exam, and it says this should be run with you know, two command line arguments, if it's not, print an error message and exit or something, right? Don't start scanning argv bracket 1 or argv bracket 2 unless you've already confirmed with argc that those arguments exist, right? If, if the first thing you do is, say, scan argv bracket 1, you might say fault, right? If you run a command with no arguments, argv bracket 1 is going to be null. And if you print it or you scan it or you string copy it, you're going to say fault. So don't ever do anything with these until you've checked this and made sure that these are meaningful. Okay, That'll save you like several points on the exam, um, if you keep that in mind. And the only way to know, is there an argv bracket 2? Right? Make sure argc is at least 3. Don't look at this and see if it's equal to something. Right? Check argc. That tells you how many argvs you have. Right, it's the size of this array of strings, basically. That's kind of all there is to say about argc, argv. Right? And it's, it's like your current ODP, right? 
Your first argument tells you how many things are in the array, which is what the second argument is. Except with main, that second argument is not an array of integers, it's an array of strings, right? Or it's an array of car stars, right? So it's a pointer to a car star. So it's a car star star. All right, S scan F, you've been doing tons of those. Um, S scan F is for converting. Okay, you have a string that has something like typically a number inside and you want to convert it to a number. So there's a string. Here's some sort of format like percent %d. And here's where you want to store the variable in. And you got to look at the return value from scanf to know what happened. So throw that in an integer and if the result is 1, then you know that i contains a number which was converted from that string. Otherwise, something went wrong. It didn't find an integer. It had an empty string something, right? So was it successful? See if the result's equal to the number of things you tried to scan. Uh, printf, I don't need to talk about printf. You've been doing printfs, but it's on there anyway. Um, F gets reads in an entire line of text, right? Don't use gets. Gets is not safe. Um, F gets, and probably the only way we've used it so far is like this. So here's a string. Here's how many bytes are available in that string. Here's where I'm reading from, which is usually standard in. And this will read until either it reads that many characters minus one or it hits a new line. It'll load the result into string and then return. And if you're at the end of a file, this will return null. Because right, fgets actually returns a pointer. So a simple way to loop with fgets might be this. So read from standard in, load the result into a string, and check to see if f gets returned a null. If it didn't, then we know that string has the next line of input. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do with that. Come back up to the top of your loop, read another string. Right? When you hit the end of the input, end of file or control D, f gets will return a null, kicks you out of your while loop. So that's a typical way to loop on this. Um, functions, so writing functions, calling functions, returning values from functions. So you've been doing this pretty exclusively in your ODPs, right? Um, prototype your functions, so before you actually use them, put in something that tells the compiler, here's the function name, here's what type of thing it returns, here's what types of things it expects as arguments, semicolon at the end. That's different from down here, where there's no semicolon. And this is the actual declaration of the function. And then return just returns a value, so that if you say variable equals function, right, it'll replace that with whatever value you returned. Um, and algorithms. Right. So um, things like doing running sums, you know, we're running products or something like that. Um, using flags to set some to save some piece of information that you're going to use later. Um, doing initializations when you need to have initial values. Looping conditionals, stateful things, all of that stuff. Right. So again, I'm not going to grill you on the syntax of an scanf statement, right? But we'd like to be able to use it as part of a bigger algorithm.
so let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, read the questions carefully. <laughs> okay. Um, by and large, I think I'm not asking you to do a lot of error checking in these programs. So I will say something like, you can assume the argument is present and is an integer, which means you should not spend a page and a half writing code to parse the argument and see if it's an integer, right? Because that's just time that's coming out of your time budget. So read the question carefully, especially if things are bold-faced, right? And only do what you have to do. And if you're not sure, just ask, right? Do we have to see if this is a valid integer, right? Go ahead and ask, and, and I'll tell you. Okay, there should be enough time to, to do or make a good stab at, at all the questions. Um, but 50 minutes is not that long of a time, right? So you want to try to work efficiently. Um, and if you're not sure how to even start a problem, go on to another problem, right? Come back to it later. Um, if there's a problem that you know you know how to do that, right, just go ahead and bang that out right, right quickly and neatly and, and put down the essentials and move on from there. Um, there's several sort of fill in the blank multiple choice questions in the beginning. I think that's a total of 15 points. So that's not a make or break thing, right? You don't want to spend a lot of time on those, um, but just some, some basic things on Unix and GDB and stuff. Um, so time budgeting is part of the challenge. Is it using the notes? Using the thing? Say again? It's the note. no. notes. 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 Uh, four pages of double sided or eight pages of single sided. Right? You shouldn't need a whole lot of notes, right? Maybe you haven't been using GDB and you can't remember, you know, the difference between step and next, right? Put that on your notes. Uh, maybe you always have trouble remembering what argc, argv are, right? Put a note down for that. You said four pages double-sided? Yes, or eight pages single-sided. Okay. So you got plenty of note budget. <laughs> um, but you don't want to spend the exam flipping through notes, right? I used to do this open book, and the book, you know, is like a few hundred pages, and it's just, just everybody like flipping through their book the whole exam, right? It's, it's uh, a false sense of, of this will be oh. easy, right, because I have all my, my book here available. So um, put down the stuff that you really have a hard time or you're not sure you can remember correctly. But most of the stuff you already know, you've been doing this for seven weeks now plus, right? And I feel like, like pretty much everybody knows how to do these things. It's, it's just kind of organizing it and, and uh, being able to demonstrate that. So it shouldn't be any surprises. Any other questions? How many questions we have? I've been asked that a few times, so I'm going to find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so seven short answer, um, three C programs, two bash programs. It's actually two C functions, one C program, and then two bash programs. And if, if it looks like I'm asking you to do something real simple, it's probably because I'm asking you to do something real simple, okay? <laughs> um, um, some of the ODPs, people are making way more complex because it just seemed too easy, <laughs> right? But, but my goal is, is to just test like certain concepts, so. If you have to write a function that adds up the elements in an array, right, that's all it's got to do. Again, you can always ask, and I'll clarify for the class. Flags? Yeah. Um, hmm, let's see. I don't know, like when you do prime numbers, prime. in 121 you use a flag, right? So you're, you're looping through, looking for a divisor, and when you find a divisor, you like set a flag, and that kicks you out of your loop, maybe. Okay. I set it uh, for and two in the beginning, at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And then change it when you find some condition. 
Flags are generally just a way to sort of record that something happened, but you're going to do something with that information later. So, yeah. Like a scanf function, you could store or the value of what a scanf return mm -hmm. returned it and evaluate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then use it later. All right. Any other questions on exam? Did I put that on here? I didn't. Okay, no regular expressions. Yeah. Yay. I really don't like grading regular expression questions. <laughs> All right. Um, so now I'm going to throw new stuff at you that is not on the exam, but that. Time. Apparently, I'm not going to be here next Friday, so I'm going to figure out something for you to do um, in class instead. I'll come up with some kind of like exercise for you to work on or something. But just a distant heads up, next Friday I'll be out. Um, yeah, not this Friday. This Friday's the exam. <laughs> next Friday, 16th. Um, Oh yeah, and there's no class Monday. All right, so so our basic if statement in bash and these conditions, right, are usually you know some expression equal equal some expression or maybe some expression that should evaluate to an integer dash eq some other expression. Right, or we can do not equal, and so on. And there's other things we can put in these conditions as well. So, um, so I I have a lot of stuff in here. Right, so I have no file called ha ha. Um, if bracket bracket dash e ha ha, then echo file exists. So dash e followed by a file name will tell you whether or not that file exists in your current directory or whatever directory you specify. So there's no file named ha ha, so this comes back empty. Um, so if I create a file named haha and then I execute this if statement, it tells me the file exists. <coughs> if I say if dash x, that'll tell me if my file is executable. So right now my file is not executable and if I try to run it, it'll say permission denied. But if I make it executable and then I say if dash x, it'll tell me it's executable. So you can inquire about the existence and the status of files by using a number of different switches. Um, and so we can do the following. Dash e tells us if the file exists. Dash D tells us if the file is a directory. Dash F tells us if it's a plain file. So if it's a directory, it'll still exist, even though I call that file exists. But it tells us if it's a directory or a file. Uh, dash R tells us if it's readable. Dash W is writable. Dash X is executable. And dash S tells us if the size is bigger than zero. So 
so from a script, you can inquire about the status of files and get information on them. And you can put those together with ampersands and pipes and so on and so forth. So those, those are available. All right, so um, tomorrow I want to talk about other ways to do looping inside Bash, and I want to talk a little bit about arrays and um, all kinds of things, menus and trap statements and um, good things like that, options in Bash and so on and so forth. So we'll pick up a bunch of odds and ends. Yeah, yeah.